right. Present full screen. Let's freaking do it. Um, okay, so if y'all don't know me, uh, my name is George. So what I do, uh, we help people high remote pay month to month for 50% less than a US employee. Um, and previously, I actually was in the venture capital world. So I worked with startups from pre-seed to a series A plus. Uh, and I George, let me pause over... you real quick. One second. Just so everyone knows, Zoom did a reformat I just learned of. George is sharing his screen right now. But if you don't, if you only see George, that's because there's a tab at the top of your Zoom screen that says George Mungia's screen. And you need to click, click on that. Otherwise, you'll just see George. All right, so, go ahead, George. That is good to know. <laughs> I did not know that. Um, I hope everyone for the past like 10 presentations I've done has not, <laughs> <laughs> has just been staring at me the whole time. Um, but anyways, guys, yeah. So used to, used to raise capital, um, super fun, love doing it, mainly work with B2B SaaS and CPG, um, industries. And yeah, bef before that as well, used to do partnerships with people like Microsoft HubSpot and I uh, do a lot of educational stuff. So a uh, little bit again about what we do. Uh, so I was actually, before I was at Coconut, I was hiring from Coconut. So I was a founder that was balling on a budget, as they say, and just trying to make it work. Um, so looking to book investor meetings, do outreach, lead gen, full cycle closing on sales, customer service, full nine yards. And I just didn't have a lot of budget before I started raising capital. Um, so this model was just the best and I had the best experience with them and I ended up joining them. Uh, so yeah, this, this is, you know, the quick pitch and we have people from Slack, Zoom, HubSpot, Dropbox. Um, and for the people that are in this call, cause we're partnering with Raj, um, luckily for you, um, yesterday we had three spots today. We have two spots left. Um, but we can give you guys 40 hours of free work. Don't get too excited over there. Um, Patrick, I'm seeing your amazing face. It looks like you're about to jump out your seat. Uh, don't get too excited, dude. Um, but yes, we can we can give you guys 40 hours of free work. We will put a link in the comments right now. Um, this is really only for people that are looking for a longer term fit. So I want to let you guys know that, but it is 40 hours of free work. If you guys fill this out in the comments right now, what we are going to put in there then you guys will be able to get a list of 250 early stage investors and angel investors. So we will DM that to you, but you have to fill out that link and apply for that free trial. And why wouldn't you? 40 hours of free work. Are you kidding me? Um, and I always like to say, be like Grace, dude, come on. Grace, she's a part of Profitable in like two months. This is a no brainer. She's awesome. Grace is the best. Uh, so be like Grace, get that free trial. And then we will DM you that early stage investor list um, right after you comment, you have the comment done in the chat. So comment done once you do that and we will send you over the list in a DM. Best day ever, come on. Um, and yeah, I also just wanna say, if you guys haven't worked with Raj, he's the freaking man. Uh, cannot say enough good things about him. So check him out. I'm super excited about this presentation today um, and we're gonna crush. And we can only do this because we work with guys like Raj. So. Awesome. Thank you, George. And shout out to Coconut VA. And you know, don't overlook that. We will DM you a list of 250 plus early stage slash angel investors. That's a huge, huge win. I had no idea that was coming out in this slide. So uh, awesome. Make sure you take up George and Coconut VA on that offer. Let's dive into today's content. So first off, um, welcome to how to not suck at pitching your startup. Um, the Couple of housekeeping items I want to take care of first would be this is highly, highly interactive and engaging. So as long as you are in a location and position where you can be on camera, I would highly appreciate if you could make it on camera because um, there will be parts where we're actually like talking to each other. Um, get ready throughout. There will be parts where I ask you to come off mute. There will be parts where um, you are um, you're, you're joining along with me and things like that. And then as well, just make sure in the chat, um, your thing is set to that. Your message is set to everyone in the meeting. For some reason, a lot of times zoom defaults to like one person or just host. Um, so make sure that, uh, your chat thing is set to everyone. Cause there's going to be parts where I ask you to be active in the chat as well. Um, I got my stuff set up here. Let me just make sure. Um, 
you all can still see my screen and let me get my Zoom boxes in front of me. All right. Um, first thing that I would need to know on video, show of thumbs up, can you still see my screen? Okay, beautiful, beautiful. For those of you who are not on your screens yet, hop to it. All right, let's go. This is how to not suck at pitching your startup. My name is Rajiv Nathan, AKA Raj Nation, the startup hype man. Um, today's content is broken into three key sections. Now, overall, what I want to tell you is we're going to focus very, very intently and specifically on your elevator pitch, aka your one-minute story, the thing you say to introduce your company. Why do we focus here? Because if you nail your first 60 seconds, then you have a shot to nail it in the next 60 minutes. If you bomb your first 60 seconds, you may never get that 60 minutes, whether it's with an investor a potential customer, a partner, a stakeholder, a buyer, whatever the thing might be that's relevant to your company. Um, this is broken into three, three sections, as I mentioned. The first third, we're going to focus on the mindset and mindset shift you need to make as it pertains to pitching. The second section or the second and third is focused specifically on the formulas and strategies that will uh, help you with your elevator pitch and help you build that out. The third section is specifically focused on showing you actual examples using those formulas and strategies so you have a very clear idea of how this is put into practice. I'm very big on tactical execution, not just pie in the sky theory. So you're going to get not just the theory, you're going to get the, the actual put in practice as well. So you are in the best position to succeed coming out of this. As a follow-up resource after we're done, I'm going to send you an email that has a link to what I call the director's cut recording. That is a pre-recorded version of this workshop that includes everything we talked about today, but also includes an extra 10, 15 ish minutes on, um, in, on, uh, specifically building out pitch decks for investors. So you'll get some of that content, but in the follow-up resource in the director's cut version, you'll also get a copy of the slides as well. Okay. So. That said, let's dive into today's content with how to not suck at pitching your startup. I just want to quickly share the mission of Startup Hype Man because I think it's relevant to everything you're going to see today. You've probably heard nine out of 10 companies fail. You've probably heard if you are a woman founder, if you're a minority owned founder, you are going to get a very small, small slice of the pie. To me, this is an environment that is designed for failure. And so it is Startup Hype Man's mission to use the power of story to make success and success inevitable and not the exception. And I like to say we can create a new reality if we do focus on story, communication, et cetera, where the three inevitables of life are, yes, you will die. You cannot avoid that. Yes, you will pay taxes. You probably should not avoid that. And in between those two things, your startup will make it. And I think the more we focus on really strong communication, the more that becomes a reality. I'm a firm believer that at the end of the day, every issue, every problem ultimately comes down to a communication problem. So if we can fix the communication, everything else becomes a lot easier. So you tuned in today for a live interactive workshop, but you probably didn't know in the process that you tuned into a live interactive game show called Pitch. Your startup, woo, woo, woo. That's right, it's Pitch Your Startup, the only live interactive game show where a room of entrepreneurs are put in front of their peers where they have to know that and you guessed it, pitch their startup. What I would like is one volunteer who wants to come on down. I will put 60 seconds on the clock and your job is to pitch me. Who would like to be our person? Now, Doppel, you, can, you, you don't count, you can't because you've, you've been through this a lot of times. <laughs> Victoria. All right. She raised her hand. Okay, everybody, give Victoria a round of applause. Woo, 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 woo. Okay, Victoria, I'm going to put 60 seconds on the clock. When I say go, go ahead and pitch me. Ready, set, go. So, hi, Raj. Pleasure to meet you. My name is Victoria Bills. I'm co founder and chief investment strategist of Bannery and Capital. We are an access platform for financial advisors looking to democratize themselves in the world of alternative investment solutions. On hey, in America. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Someone else was okay. not on mute. Okay. Um, democratizing in the world, world of finance. So, 
how many of, so if you have a financial advisor, you probably have someone who operates as a fiduciary on your behalf to make certain that you are investing to the best of your capabilities. But did you know that almost 78% of financial advisors don't use alternative investments? And the difference between using alternatives versus a standard investment portfolio can mean the difference in almost 10 years taken out of your potential retirement time. So instead of retiring at 50, you'll probably retire at 60. And so what we're looking to do is creating a all access platform that allows for financial advisors to source alternatives that meet the needs of their clients and also for asset managers for them to be able to work and pitch directly to financial advisors in order to basically generate dollars on their behalf. So that's our company in a nutshell. We're currently raising about $2 million in seed funding. Looking forward to chatting with you further in the future. <laughs> All right. Everybody give her a round of applause. Thank you, Victoria. Stay with me for a moment. Um, I gave you a little bit of overtime because of the uh, the random interruption in the middle there. Um, with the overtime, you ended up going about 75 seconds. Long, or sorry, even, even accounting for the overtime and, and bumping that back into normal time. You went about 75 seconds long. But first, tell me, how do you feel right now? Um, I think what I would love, cause like usually when I'm pitching it, it's usually like in person. And so it's like, I don't necessarily go into the full spiel, but, um, I felt good about it, but I also was curious, like I was kind of going in the back of my mind, like, all right, what else can I say? Or what would be important for me to highlight rather than like, I think context is important because like when I'm having just like casual conversations, I don't bring up metrics, but if this is like a pitch pitch that I was like, okay, well, let me go into the how and the why rather than the um, metrics of what we're doing or how we're performing. If I heard that right, does it, it sounds like you're then you were, as you were talking, you were trying to figure out what additional point did you want to add next? Did I catch that right? Yeah. Okay. Um, and scale of one to 10, how would you rank your pitch? Six, seven. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, do you mind if everyone else offers their input on how they would rank it in the chat? Sure. Absolutely. Okay. Everyone else, go ahead, scale of one to 10, drop your score for Victoria in the chat. Let's see it. <laughs> Thanks, Vivek. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So first off, I want to thank you for um, standing up and, and being brave and, and, and talking to a room of people you probably don't even know, most of whom you don't even know. Um, I would probably put it somewhere in like the five to six area as some of the other people are. Uh, I think there's some really good elements. It's just as kind of the flow of information can change. And one thing that I think is really important is you always want to know where you're taking it. Um, you want to, you don't want to be necessarily having to think about what comes next as you're talking, because then you potentially end up repeating yourself or sounding confused as you're actually talking. Now you didn't sound confused yourself in that moment, but that is something that can happen to people. But I want to thank you for being brave. And let's say we get this from a, what people are saying, a six-ish, you said a seven up to a 10 uh, through the material today. Okay, excited. Awesome. Thank you. You can go back on mute now. For everyone else in the chat, I've got a question for you. Why did you not raise your hand and take the opportunity? Now, again, Dapo, you don't count because you did raise your hand, but you already know all this stuff, so you can't. Uh, I, I excluded you, but for everyone else, what was going on? I gave you, there was probably 15 seconds there before Victoria jumped at the opportunity. So uh, talk me through, just put your quick answer in the chat. Why did you not jump at the opportunity? Why did you not raise your hand or take up the, uh, take up the offer? Too slow, all right. Like too slow to react or your pitch is too slow. William, not prepared for the one minute, prepared for the four minute, but not ready for the one minute. All right. Still formulating the initial pitch, not ready, don't have my talking points polished, multitasking. <laughs> All right. That's why I say you got to focus in on this. Don't, don't put baby in the corner browser tab for the next uh, 40 minutes or so. Um, loud location today. All right. So some of you have some environmental stuff. Anyone feel like they're just like not ready? um or don't don't like being put on the spot things like that and i think that kind of hits on like what sam and, and david and maybe william were talking about there just don't have the thing formulated so i want you to kind of look around to the room and 
if that's you, just I want you to see like you're not alone. That's how really every entrepreneur is as it comes to figure like giving that that introductory pitch, that one minute elevator pitch. So you're not alone in that. At the same time, I am here to tell you, you might not be alone, but it's also not okay. Because I promise you, what will not happen is a potential investor or customer or stakeholder of some kind walks up to you and says, uh, hey, William, not today, but 48 hours from now, I want to meet you back on this piece of sidewalk here at this corner of the road. And then I want to hear you pitch me. So get all the jitters out, figure it out, like get, you know, get it through, you know, and come back to me. We'll meet here two days from now, same time, same place, and then I'll be ready to receive it. That's what's not going to happen. What is going to happen is you will find yourself at an event. You will be networking. People will ask you, what does your company do? You will find yourself at a conference where you're walking the floor. Perhaps you have a booth at a trade show or conference and people are directly walking up to you to learn about your company. And if you haven't prepared for that, if you don't know what you want to say, or if what you say is something you don't even like, why are you wasting money on a booth? You might even find yourself in an elevator, actually. So that's why the, the lesson here is I want you to be prepared. Don't let yourself get away with the excuse of I'm not ready yet. And so what we're going to do today is talk through how do we actually get you ready from, again, from a mindset and from a formula and strategy perspective. So for all of you who didn't feel ready, I want you to meet a couple other entrepreneurs who were in the exact same boat as you, Kim and Joyce, the co-founders of a company called Honest Game. Uh, they took a very similar version of this workshop a few years back uh, afterwards. They walked up to me. They had these things to say. The top quote is Kim. The bottom quote is Joyce. Uh, but also they walked up to me and they said, we are so out of sync with each other. Kim goes, Joyce and I can be in the same room. We can talk to two different people. Those two people can talk to each other and they'll be convinced they just met two different companies. That's how out of sync they were as co-founders pitching the same company. So the goal was, how do we get them to a point where people don't just understand it and get it, but they're actually like motivated by it and they want to take some kind of action as a result of it? How do you get them to the point of not being confused, but understanding it and saying, wait, 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 tell me more. This is really interesting. That was the goal. And so as we talk through all the content today, I just want to share it to you through the lens of two people who went through the exact same thing that you're going through right now. Now, at the time, they were ready to onboard a few pilot customers um, en route to, to fully launching their company. Let me take a step back for a moment and just tell you a little bit more information on myself and why I care about this so much. Uh, my core life belief, the thing that drives me, why, why, is a deep-rooted belief that everyone deserves a voice. And that is what fuels all of my pursuits. So if you have not met me before, uh, I have a pretty eclectic background. I am a hip hop artist. I make music. I make rap music about startup life. So that song, those of you who tuned in at the top of the hour that was playing, that was actually my song. If you go on Spotify or Apple Music right now, type in Raj Nation, all one word, R-A-J Nation. Um, you'll see my album and, and, a, and a, uh, one, another one or two songs that are out. Uh, the album dropped almost exactly a year ago. Uh, it's called Goat to Market, and it is a complete album documenting the journey of starting and building a company. Um, in addition to being a hip hop artist, I'm also a yoga instructor. The way I approach teaching a yoga class is through the lens of storytelling. If anyone takes my class, they know I almost always start with a theme. I carry that theme throughout class and I build the poses together as if I am weaving a narrative arc with your body. And yoga is a matter of like creating expression within oneself. I am also a professional announcer and TV broadcaster for MMA. So when I am doing this, uh, you will see if I'm doing the TV broadcast, the play by play, my job is to tell a story to the viewing audience at home. If you've ever watched sports on mute, you'll know it's not very interesting, right? The broadcaster is what helps give context to what you're seeing. 
And when I'm in the ring doing the announcing of the fighters, like literally the person being like, and in the blue corner, my job is to give each of those fighters a voice or an identity for that fight so that the crowd who's live in the arena buys into that fight being interesting and important. And all of that comes together in running Startup Hype Man, which I've been doing for the last seven-ish, eight years now, where we work directly with startups on this exact thing, pitch development, whether it's the one-minute pitch, the five-minute pitch, or all the conversations in between, getting the story right and done so in a way where, again, people lean in and no longer is a bad pitch getting in the way of a good prop. It's been cool to have this impact of voice really shine through over the years and this emphasis on voice. We worked with a ton of companies across the globe over the years, fueled a bunch of dollars in capital raises and uh, sales lift uh, and fueled a lot of pitch competition wins actually. So Dapo, who I think is still on this, has won like, how many times Dapo? Four or five competitions, just yourself. Um, and Dapo is a product of, of our system, actually, with uh, two different companies of his. So all of this to say, I really, really get like jazzed by this stuff. And I am like, I dedicate you know, nearly every waking hour that I have. Uh, if it's not thinking about you know my family, I'm thinking about this. And what are the ways we can better improve our communication, better tell stories, and better get our point across? All of that said... I have also come across a lot of really bad ways to pitch. And very, very often, I will hear founders say things like, we are building a disruptive technology. We have an AI-powered ML system that does X. We're a platform that does X, Y, and Z. The market for machinery is 90 billion over the next five years. Right. All of those things are things that when we present it to someone, we're trying to play a role. We're trying to impress them. But in trying to quote unquote impress them, it most often has a backfire effect. And instead, you end up just kind of sounding something more like this. Did you know that disco record sales were up 400% for the year ending 1976? If these trends continue, hey! Uh, your fish are dead. Yeah, I know. I can't get them out of there. So, there's a different way we should be pitching. Before we get into that, let's talk about why this is actually important. I want to share with you, you know, like I share with you my background. So obviously, like I believe this is important, but if you don't want to take my word for it, I want you to take the word of the next few people I'm going to show you on this slide. The first person is a guy named Raj Bhargava. I um, joke that he's the Tom Brady of entrepreneurship because in startup land, I would say the equivalent of winning a championship is IPOing or exiting. He's done that eight times or seven times. He's got four or five IPOs to his name. He's had two or three exits. He's still running his eighth company. It's called Jump Cloud. Um, and he helped co-found Techstars. He co-authored a really good book called The Startup Playbook, which I recommend everyone go out and read. Uh, he told me, uh, when I had him on my podcast several years back, I asked him, hey, where are startups overlooking or where do they need to slow down uh, now so they don't overlook it and then, and then stumble later? He said, I think messaging is one of the most important things startups can focus on and it gets glossed over all the time. I think most companies fail at it and that's probably why a lot of them actually fail overall. So if you don't take my word for it, please take his word for it. If you still don't wanna take his word for it, take the words of the next person, Sean Amirati. Sean said, how you end up like a WordPress or a YouTube is you have your foundational elevator pitch extremely tight. It really is the core building block upon which you can build all the different communications important for your business. Sean is a professor of entrepreneurship at Carnegie Mellon. He's also an angel investor himself and the author of the book, The Science of Growth. Another thing I highly recommend you go out and read. That one also happens to be on audiobook if you're more of an audio person with books. Um, what him and his research team did at Carnegie was study... I nearly identical products in nearly identical markets and looked at what were the factors that led one to scale up and the other to stall out. So for example, they compare 
Side by side, they compare YouTube, which everyone knows today, against another company called Rever, which no one has heard of. They had the same product in the early mid 2000s. What did YouTube do well that Rever missed out on? That's what this book analyzes. I highly recommend you read. If you still don't want to take his word for it, please, please, please take the words of Abhinaya Kondaru, who is a um, uh, active VC in Chicago, where I am. I had coffee with her and her words verbatim were, storytelling is the number one most important founder trait because it's not just that it means you can pitch me. Good storytelling is a leading indicator of your ability to get customers and hire the right people, which will ultimately determine your success. That is why this is so important. You are giving a nod, especially when it's an investor, you're giving a nod to them that you have the skills to now recruit customers and bring the right team on board because you're able to sell in a vision. You're able to sell in a value prop. Now, with all of this said, I want to do, if, can we all just by nods, can we agree that your story is in fact important? Yeah? Okay. So let's do this. We're going to do a call and response. Come off of mute. I'm going to say something and then I'll have you respond, repeat it back to me. So bring yourselves off of mute. My product, my my product, product, my product, my product <laughs> does not mean shit. Does, does not, not mean, does not mean shit. Mean shit. Without a compelling story. Without, Without a compelling, a compelling, compelling story. story. Let's do it all together as one full sentence now. Three, two, one. My, my product, product, product does not mean, does not mean shit. shit. Uh, Without a story. compelling story. story. Okay, thank you. Now we can all agree on that. Let's move forward now into what we actually care about. Money, right? We are trying to get the bag. We are trying to raise capital. We're trying to generate revenue. If that sounds a little bit too on the nose for you, you can also extrapolate this meaning to we are trying to create economic impact with our work, with our work, with our work. We are trying to build generational wealth for our families. We are trying to create jobs in the economy, right? That is sort of what's on the other side of all of this. And if we know the story is important and we know that the story can generate the dollars, there's a gap here. And it can be really tough to make that happen when you're feeling tongue-tied. And maybe when you get that opportunity, or maybe earlier in this, in this uh, workshop, when I gave anyone the opportunity to pitch, maybe you were worried it was going to sound a little something like this. The dog, uh, the dog, you put the food in the thing, uh, and then the dog sees it, and uh, <clears throat> food's dangling, dangling, uh, it's dangling, uh, dog, 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 dog looks at dang, dang. Tail wag wag, uh, rough dog wag and the tag, um, uh, whatever dog's name is. Dog's name is Claire. Claire, come in. Who's, who's, uh, Claire sees dog food. Pick Facebook, like, 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 sizzle, pick, pick. strategy, strategy. Sex. sex, something, something, something. something. This is the worst pitch I have ever seen. A little bit of an exaggeration, but maybe that is how you're at least feeling on the inside. Like you're stumbling over your words, repeating yourself, just saying like a bunch of buzzwords. So if that's where you're at today, I want to pose a question to you. What is the purpose of a pitch? In the chat, throw, throw an answer in there. You can think about the purpose or the goal of a pitch. What is the purpose of a pitch? convey a message to someone, to convey information and inspire, to get the person hooked, curious for more, follow-up meeting, give the audience interest, close the deal, get that next meeting. So emotion, emotion, emotion. So some of these are outputs, like closing the deal, getting to the next meeting, um, getting the person hooked and curious for more. Some of these are functions, like convey message to someone. But what I realized earlier this year, after having studied the over 300 pitches we have developed in the last seven, eight years, was something different, actually. 
Because prior to that, I would have actually agreed, hey, the purpose of your pitch is to convey information that gets you to the next step. And I think that's actually like a, it's, it's a derivative of what the actual purpose is. And what I realized was that the purpose of a pitch is to make your audience feel seen. Because when your audience feels seen, they will trust you with their time, energy, information, and ultimately, yes, their money. When they feel seen, they find a piece of themselves in the story you're telling, or they find a way to, to, re to relate to the audience you're talking about in the story you're telling. And if they cannot find themselves or find empathy for the audience you're talking about, your story really isn't worth telling. So what doesn't make them feel seen? Huge, big, broad numbers, right? Like the market size mistake, where you lead with X is a, is a, $47 billion industry, right? So don't swing your big TAM energy. That is not your differentiating factor, nor does it inspire people to action. But I see so many founders will, will open. Machine learning is a $250 billion industry. And they deliver that expecting the other person to be like, oh my God, take my money now, right? That's not where you want to be. Instead, you really want to be able to get to the heart of something that helps your audience feel seen or shows them you know how to make your target audience feel seen. So what is it that's holding everyone back at the end of the day? Well, it's a concept that I call the messaging treadmill. I have trained over 5,000 entrepreneurs over the years, and these are the top three reasons that have come back. I call it the messaging treadmill because We've all agreed that this stuff is important, but it really feels like whenever we're working on it, one step forward is one step backward. And the, the, the top three reasons that have come out with this messaging treadmill are number one, being too in the weeds of your own company to be able to take a step back and look at and think about it with fresh eyes and ears. When you're so buried in it, it's, it's really hard to be able to have that kind of a lens. Number two is perhaps being too technical. Maybe you're the product engineer, you're the product person, you built the software, but then, and you know that side of it really well, but the kind of external facing communication is not your uh, expertise. And then number three is being too caught up in the day-to-day. -day. You are a founder. You are running your company. You have a million things going on at any given point. And I know how this works. You might even have work on pitch on your to-do list and it might be 10th on the to-do list. You will knock out the nine things ahead of it and then stare at that one at number 10 and then find nine new things to put ahead of it before you actually start working on it. And that'll happen two or three times over. over. So when it, you're doing so many other things, it can be really hard to be like, all right, let me sit down and figure out this one thing. And then if you take all of that and put it together, you will get a sort of an inconvenient summary that this is entrepreneurship, which comes with its own ongoing daily mental crisis where you wake up, you pour your coffee in the morning at 7 a.m., you make the mistake of checking email on your phone while pouring your coffee, and then all of a sudden you're like, you find out, oh my God, the app has been offline for the last 24 hours and nobody told me. And now you've got emails from angry users and customers who are like, you're stealing my data. I can't access anything that's mine. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tear you a new one on Reddit, all that kind of stuff. You get an email an hour later that's like from an investor you met last week who said, thanks, but no thanks. We're going to pass on you. Uh, you get another email from a customer you met with a few days ago who said, appreciate your time, but not for us right now. By this point, you're like, I really should have listened to my family and stayed in that safe and secure job that paid a high salary. What am I thinking? 2 p.m. something good happens, you feel okay. 3 p.m. something bad happens. And it's this crazy roller coaster of emotions that happens day in and day out every single day. And guess what? We are founders, so it's also on the weekend. Even if we're not working per se, our minds are still working and thinking about it. And so when all of that is building up in our head, it can be really difficult to even have a positive impression of our own company, right? When you know how the sausage gets made, it's hard to tell them this is tasty. And that is what we've found to be the, the most consistent reasons. Now, what I would love is in the chat, use the numbers one or two or three or a combination of those numbers. And let me know, what do you feel represents your situation? Or if it's none of them, tell me something else.
All right, all three. That's totally fair. Sam, number three, too caught up in the day to day. David, also too caught up in the day to day. Dave Kovarubias, also number three, caught up in the day to day. Okay, good. I can see this is resonating. Patrick's a one to two. So this is pretty consistent with what I've heard time and time again. With Kim and Joyce, our friends at Honest Game, they were very, very much reasons one and two being too in the weeds and too technical. So what we have to do is figure out how do we get out of that state of mind? It starts with making the mindset shift. So lesson number one that I taught to Kim and Joyce and that I'm teaching to every single one of you right now, mindset shift from this day forward, write this down, from this day forward, stop thinking like an entrepreneur. Instead, think like an entertainer. Why an entertainer? Because the entertainer has one concern. How do I make my audience feel something? How do I move them? Think of your favorite musician when you go and see them live. They do not take the stage and say, all right, Austin, Texas, how are you doing tonight? And you're all like, yeah. Okay, so tonight we're gonna play every song from our entire catalog. That's 12 studio albums. It's about 15 songs per album. We're gonna go through all of that. When we finish that, we're also gonna take you through some of these uh, rough drafts and some B-sides. Uh, when we get through that, uh, we're gonna, we wanna play some stuff that's not fine tuned yet. It's not gonna sound good to you, but it's really important to us that you're aware that this stuff exists. And then we wanna spend a little bit of time after that taking you, giving you a window into our upcoming six to nine month music roadmap. It will take 39 hours to get through it all. Who's with me? Now there's probably one person in the world who can pull that off and it's Taylor Swift. But aside from Taylor Swift, people are gonna be like, uh, yo, play the hits, that's what, we, that's what we came for. We gotta get home at some point, right? They stick to the hits. They curate a set list based on the emotion they want to leave their audience with. And that set list is curated around that emotion. What do I want my audience to feel when they leave this thing? And that's your job as well. Curate your quote unquote greatest hits set list. And you'll notice the fact that they have a set list allows them to break script given the right scenario. So if they find that one city is vibing at a certain point, maybe they'll add an extra song because they know it's gonna work for that city. Maybe they'll switch up a lyric that matters to Chicago versus to Detroit. But they don't just go in and wing it being like, yeah, let's just see what happens tonight. And I don't want you to do that either, being like, let me just see what I'm gonna end up saying. Think like an entertainer. A great example of this in song lyric is one of my favorite music artists, Jay-Z. Now, about 20 years ago, he had a song called Moment of Clarity, where he was comparing his success to the successes of a couple other, at the time, underground artists who didn't have as much success by the names of Common, who also went by Common Sense, and Talib Kweli. And Jay-Z rapped, I dumbed down for my audience and doubled my dollars. If skills sold, truth be told, I'd probably be lyrically Talib Kweli. Truthfully, I want to rhyme like common sense, but I did five mil. I ain't been rhyming like common sense. Effectively, what he is saying is, look, I actually could be the most lyrically dense, socially conscious, intricate rapper you have ever heard of. But I realized if I wanted to break through to the mainstream, I had to meet my audience where they were. And once I did that, I did 5 million sales of a single record and I never looked back. And this was essentially Jay-Z calling his own shop because just a few years ago, he became hip hop's first billionaire. And the thing is, it's not like Talib Kweli and Common aren't also successful. They are, but compare their success to that of the other two, or excuse me, compare their success to that of Jay-Z. And the question you have to ask yourself when you decide you want to do a high growth startup is, do I want to sell out basements or do I want to sell out arenas? And if you want to sell out arenas, then think like an entertainer is the mindset to adopt. Another quick way to visualize this is through this graphic here from the company User Onboard. You have Super Mario. Small Mario is your potential customer. The flower is your product. You combine those things together 
you get the big, bad, successful Mario stomping over Koopa, saving the day. You are selling the right side of the equation, not the left side. So how do we start to make that happen? Well, um, we don't have time today to watch this video, but on your own time, I would recommend you watch this. I'm going to type it in the chat here. You're going to go to YouTube and type in Google search the reunion. Watch that, turn your subtitles on because it's not in English and have a tissue box nearby. That is such a good example of showing up for your audience, not showing up for yourself. So as we start to think about how does this come together? How do you take this mindset and build it into an elevator pitch? I think it would be good to start off by covering off a really good elevator pitch. And so over the years, searching high and low and far and wide, the single greatest elevator pitch actually comes from a source of entertainment. And it is Will Smith and the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Earlier, I told you, you did not realize you were tuning into a live game show. You also did not realize you were tuning into a live sing-along concert. So what I want everyone to do is come off of mute. And I know there's going to be internet lags and everything. But together, we are going to sing the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air theme song. All right, bring yourself off. And I don't care if you're a good singer or rapper or whatever. Uh, we're doing this. So. Bring yourselves off a mute and a one and a two and a three. Now this is a story all about, all about how my life got flipped, flipped and turned upside, upside down. down. I'd like to take a minute, just sit right there, there, tell you how I became the prince of a town called Bel Air. In West Philadelphia, born and raised, and raised. the playground is where I spend most of my days. My days. Filling out, maxing, relaxing, all cool, and all shooting some b-ball outside of my school when a couple of guys who were up to no good started making trouble, trouble in, my neighborhood. in my neighborhood. I got in one little fight. My mom got scared. She said, you're moving with your auntie and uncle in Bel Air. All right, we'll pause it there. Thank you for those of you who contributed. Appreciate you. Now, why do we sing that? It's fun, yeah, but that is Will Smith's elevator pitch for the show. He's telling a story. I had this rough upbringing in Philadelphia. There was a good chance if I stayed there, I was going to get involved in the wrong activities. My mom saw this early on, and she recognized the only way to fulfill my potential was if she sent me off to Bel Air, California, so I would have the right family system around me, access the right education, and be able to tap into the right resources, so ultimately, I could grow into the man she knew I was capable of becoming. That's what's being explained in that upfront elevator pitch, right? And that's what allows every episode to make sense. If you could watch episode, you could episode, uh, excuse me, watch episode one or episode 101. As long as you've seen or heard that intro, you have context. If you've never seen or heard the intro and you watch an episode, you'll spend the entire episode trying to piece together what's the story here. Your elevator pitch needs to do just that. It needs to give people the right context to be able to take in the larger story. The larger story being the follow-on conversation, the pitch deck, uh, the, the sales interaction, et cetera. But you're not trying to give them everything up front. You're just teasing the plot. So keep that in mind as you put together an elevator pitch. Are you giving away everything or are you giving away just enough to get them to not want to change the channel because there's more good stuff on the other side? How do we do that? Well, to build an elevator pitch, it starts with figuring out your position. So here's the first formula and strategy I want to hit you with. Um, when we think about our position in the market, I call this the superhero positioning strategy. You have to think of yourself as a superhero because what do superheroes do? They help and they save people. What are you doing? You're helping and you're saving a section of the market from something. But generally speaking, what's happening when a superhero comes in. And let's use Batman as an example, right? Like what's happening that makes him put on the cape to save the day? Well, look what's happening on the slide. You have absolute chaos at play. The bank has been robbed. Joker's blown up the hospital, right? The football field has imploded. Someone's getting mugged in the street. All of these are the things that make Batman put on the cape and come in and save the day. Batman does not save Gotham on a sunny day. If it's like 85 degrees outside, people have their kids at the park, they're taking their dog for a walk, you don't see Batman swoop in and say, well, I'm here to save you. Because if he did, how would the people react? They would say, uh, what are you doing here? Why are you wearing that creepy cape? And stay the hell away from my children. 
they would get the exact opposite impression of Batman. But because he swoops in when something really bad is happening, what do they say? Thank you, Batman, for saving me. So similarly, I hear so many entrepreneurs try and save Gotham on a sunny day. They swoop in and they say, our AI platform does this, this, and this. You got to take it a step back. So to develop your positioning relative to the market, use the superhero positioning strategy. What this means is in order for you to su the superhero to exist, there must first be a person in distress. With a person in distress, a village is set on fire. When the village is on fire, you can activate a superpower. And with your superpower activated, da, 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 the superhero comes in and saves the day. Or in business speak, the target audience, the problem or problem set that they have, your approach to that problem, and ultimately your solution. The reason why this is so effective as a positioning exercise, and you do this first, the reason why it's so effective is because it gets you in the frame of reference of your audience. You think about the context in which they are experiencing things first, you empathize with them, which is so important. And through that layer of empathy, you introduce what your offering actually is. So this is the strategy you use first. And this is what we take every company that we work with through. It's what we took Kim and Joyce with Honest Game through. If you do this on your own, sheet of paper, draw four columns, and just start bullet pointing your answers. Do not worry about how it sounds. Just get the, uh, the ideas out of your head. This is an internal reference document. But what it's going to do is give you the raw material to create your elevator pitch. So on the next slide, I'm going to show you the elevator pitch formula that you extract out of this. Are we ready for that? If so, in the chat, type in capital letters the word pitch. All right, the chat's coming in. Pitch, 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 pitch. The crowd is chanting it. They are on their feet. They want to see it. Ladies and gentlemen, the most deadly effective yet easy to remember elevator pitch formula is, I call it, que pasa. For anyone who knows Spanish, que pasa, you will know that in Spanish, que pasa means what's up or what's happening. And as it pertains to your elevator pitch, you have to do the exact same thing. Tell people what's up. What's up with them? What's up with you? Que pasa? P-A-S-A, -A, which stands for problem, approach, solution, action. 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 Again, what you're doing by following this formula is highlighting the context and frame of reference first, and then using that as a way to generate empathy. If it's directly your customers, it's empathy with your customers. If it's an investor, you are showing them how you generate empathy with your customers. And you're using that as the entry point into talking about your offering. This completely flips the style of communication, right? Most people are communicating outside in. This is an inside out way of communicating. And this is gonna, this is gonna grab people. This is gonna get them emotionally hooked. And this is what inspires people to pay attention. This is how you make your audience feel seen. Because by flipping it, by doing it in this inside out way, you are no longer leading with your offering. You are leading to it. Big difference. And by starting here, by doing it in this formula, you're showing your audience you get them and then walking hand in hand over to your side of the table. Instead of in a, playing a game of tug of war, trying to yank them over to your side, you are collaborating and walking hand in hand over to your side. So who's ready to see some examples using the K-Pasa formula? Yeah? Okay. So I'm going to show you a few different companies here. The first company is Christine Izwakora's company, Cyber Pop-Up. 
Here was the situation she was in. She needs to balance the seriousness and the private nature of cybersecurity with the flexibility and simplicity of her platform so people understand the value, how we're different, and why they should trust us. Christine was, at the time, executing the platform, the marketplace, as a manual service. She was the marketplace at this point in time, but she knew she needed to get her name out there, get the money to build the technology through pitch competitions and investor capital. Here was the pitch under the KPASA model. Starting with the problem. Your server was hacked. You failed an audit. Your latest software update is vulnerable. Cybersecurity is serious business. It's also highly specialized. So why would you find an expert in the same team? Your market's from the same place. Your marketing team gets their freelance graphic designers. Yeah. Meanwhile, traditional consulting firms take you through a sales process that lasts months. But you needed someone for the job like yesterday. Get vetted specialists in a fraction of the time at a time when you need it most with Cyber Papa. Submit your project and get started as early as the same day. We manage the team and verify all your requirements are met so you get the highest quality delivery without the headaches. Cybersecurity isn't a matter of if, but when. So when it hits the fan, go to cyberpopup.com. Capital letter C in the chat if you have a baseline understanding of how Cyber Popup might be valuable to its audience of uh, small and medium-sized businesses with cybersecurity issues or threats. Good, 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 good. And where did this lead her? Like I said, the elevator pitch is foundational material. It is the backbone of your pitch deck. It influences your website homepage copy. It helps dictate your sales messages and your sales outreach. For Christine, it was the catalyst behind pitch competitions because her run was insane. Over the course of a year, these were the messages that came back. Sidebar, I won 20K in a competition yesterday. How many of you would like to have a sidebar email to in an email to someone as a sidebar? You're like, casually, I won 20K. Then another 5K from a competition. Then 100K. And then the following weekend, another 100K. So much, so, so many wins, she got media attention. Over the course of a year, she raised around $250,000 through pitch competitions alone. And then this helped fuel her to a successful seed round. So big ups to Christine and Cyber Pop-Up. And again, it all comes back to KPASA. Let's look at another example. This is Nestor, the founder of Siva Seguros. The investors are struggling to see differentiation when it comes to auto insurance. So what do we do? We apply KPASA. Every driver in America needs auto insurance. If you're white and affluent, that's not a problem. But if you're Latino and live in a Spanish-speaking zip code, Major carriers prey on you with hidden fees for purchasing, renewing, adding a family member, changing your car, changing your address, you name it. Not to mention being told you have to spend a Tuesday afternoon at an agent's office because you don't qualify for online service. The gecko doesn't dish out 15% in 15 minutes in the barrio. Sigo Seguros is fair insurance without the fight. In just a few minutes and a few taps, get state minimum limit liability coverage, no hidden fees, no annoyed visiting to an office. And as more drivers use Sega, we provide better rates and enhance our advantage over the existing carriers who don't have the data in the first place and can't access it through their convoluted layers. Learn more at SegoSeguros.com. Capital letter S in the chat if you see how their auto insurance product would be valuable to their audience of the Latino, Latina, Latina community. And where did this take them? Well... It was uh, this year, no, it was earlier this year or last year that they announced uh, around a $5.1 million funding round, right? Again, this model is the backbone behind it, really every type of pitch you have. Let's take a look at Carson and fan food. I have a video of this. Here was his before. I, similar to Victoria, I put him on camera and I said, uh, tell me about your pitch. It's, it's weird. It's not showing up. Hopefully, it's, hopefully it'll play. There we go. Alrighty, Fan Food is a mobile concession app that allows fans at live events to order concessions from their phone. They can choose to have it delivered to their seat or they can pick it up through an express line. The value add for the end user, the fan, is that we're going to maximize the user experience. The value add for the venue is that we're going to increase their revenues and the per cap. Eh, not very good. Quick heads up here. We're going to run a few minutes over time. I'll have you out of here uh, no later than five after. For those of you who can stick around, please do. 
So we take it from that, then we apply k pasta. Here's what it looks like instead. Hey there, my name is Carson Goodell, CEO and co-founder of FanFood. Now as a diehard sports fan, there's nothing more frustrating when you're at your team's game than missing a big play because you were stuck waiting in a line for a hot dog and beer. Fan food keeps you in the moment. Our mobile ordering app brings concessions directly to your seat so you never have to miss the big play. Now we are currently live in five venues in three different states, our two largest being a major league soccer venue and the Formula One Raceway down in Austin, Texas. Download our app today on the iOS and Android store. Confidence, swagger, and the pitch makes sense, right? Here it is written out, capital letter F in the chat if you understand how fan food is valuable. And they had a really good run as well. Right away, they won a thousand bucks and they won 25,000. That 25,000 came with meeting Damon from Shark Tank and getting direct consulting from him. Uh, then they had a successful crowd run. They raised around, and then they were able to scale their customer base to pretty much every major team or every major type of uh, event and venue. Now let's come back to our friends, Honest Game, Kim and Joyce. Remember what they said, what their situation was, and what they were struggling with. Well, we applied the K-Pasa pitch, and as I've mentioned, this gives you multiple use cases. So this K-Pasa became the script for an explainer video for their company which they actually use as part of a submission in a competition and in other places as well. Here's what the pitch sounds like. We start with the problem. When you're a star high school student athlete, you compete tirelessly on the court and in the classroom to achieve your one dream of playing in college. Top schools recruit you and even offer you a scholarship. Then senior year hits and you find out that the class you took actually doesn't count. Your GPA is .25 off or your SAT score is 10 points too low. Even with the experts in your corner, school counselors, parents, and coaches, athletic eligibility rules can be confusing to navigate. And often by the time you find out you're ineligible, it's too late to catch up. Boom, game over. Approach. Honest game is the clear pathway for getting in. We automate the process so the student, the parent, the coach, the counselor, and the college all get real-time eligibility updates. With Honest Game, everyone knows what to do before it's too late. In the last, in the interest of time, I'll pause it there. They have some extra data in there for the purpose of the video. Capital letter H in the chat. If you see how high school student athletes who desire to play in college and the colleges who recruit them would find value in this platform. Good, 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 good. And what was their story? What was their journey? Well, I mentioned they were about to onboard eight unpaid, uh, seven or eight unpaid pilot customers to get things off the ground. In the course of this, they got an opportunity to enter a pitch competition sponsored by the Chicago Bulls in partnership with a group called Loud Capital, a VC group. 221 companies applied and Honest Game made it into the semifinals, the top 20 without even having revenue yet. Now those top 20 got to pitch and that was whittled down to a top five. And it was really cool because even with, without revenue yet and just the unpaid pilots, Honest Game made it into the top five. Even cooler, it didn't end there. Those top five got to pitch on center court at the United Center in front of Bulls executives, Loud Capital team, and some other important business leaders. It didn't end there. The next night during the first timeout of the Bulls game, they announced the winner on court and guess who got to stand tall holding the big check, but Kim and Joyce, the two co-founders from Honest Game who just a couple months before that were confusing everyone with their pitch. But now the k -Pasa not only got them that one minute story, it fueled the story for their pitch deck, their five to seven minute story. It fueled all the conversations they were having in between. And that 50K then on-ramped them towards a over $2 million seed round. The last I checked in with them, they were up to seven-figure annual revenue. All of this comes back to, I mean, of course, you have to good product, but on the communication side, it all comes back to being able to tell a compelling story. So 
big ups to honest game. Uh, they're two of my favorite people, uh, ever and their, their continued success. They just announced yesterday, earlier this week, a official partnership with the Illinois high school, uh, athletic association, the IHSA, uh, to be the official, um, uh, vendor of record, uh, for academic athletic academic eligibility. My friends, that is the Kpasa elevator pitch formula and why it's so important. So remember, think like an entertainer. That's the mindset shift to make. Develop your position using the superhero positioning strategy. Create your pitch using the Kpasa elevator pitch formula. And then with all of that, you have the foundation to be able to build a knockout pitch deck, customer facing messaging, website copy, et cetera. I want to leave you with one other thing. This is what we do every day of the week. So if you want Startup Hype Man's help with this, the QR code in the top right corner will take you directly to my calendar page where we can talk through and see if we're a fit for you. We have a very complete process um, where we build a pitch kit for you if fundraising is on your mind, uh, where we're going to do some, we're going to do several components that round out your one minute, your five to seven minute, and your, your in-between conversation as well. Um, you can find the information on that at startuphypeman.com slash fundraising. Um, once again, here is the QR code if you want the link directly to book. Um, in my follow-up email to you, I will also send you the calendar link as well. I would also encourage you, please connect with me on LinkedIn. And we've got an online founder community called the Goat to Market Club. So go ahead and join that as well. Um, good place to connect with other founders. We're adding more content in there um, each week and each month. Um, and, and there's also some good partner offers too that you can take advantage of. I will stay if anyone has extra questions. I'll stay for a few more minutes. Um, but that's all I've got. But I think the, the one final thing I'll say is you have a choice coming out of this. You can continue to put off the message, the pitch, the story until the absolute last second you need it and then you're scrambling and you're rushing. And then what you say the next day on stage or whatever the environment is, isn't something you love. Or you can get ahead of all of it now and prioritize it today because you recognize like I recognize that your pitch is what fuels your go-to-market strategy. It is what fuels your marketing and sales messaging. It's what fuels your fundraising opportunities. And that's why it's so important to do it early and not wait until the last possible minute. I appreciate all of you. Thank you. Again, I'll stick on for a couple more minutes if anyone has questions. If you don't, thank you for being here and I'll, I'll get you that follow-up information uh, in the email. Raj, I'm going to Thank you to George gotta... and Coconut VA um, who also have the amazing offer for you, which Cassie just put in the chat. Awesome. I have to jump. I'm late for another one, but guys, thank you so much, Raj. You're the man. This was so awesome. Um, very awesome. Good. Thank you. So bye guys. You're welcome, Joelle. Victoria, from your first pitch to now, do you feel like you have some good material to work with? Definitely. Um, it's also like, it's definitely like something I'll definitely, I have to like rework and, um, I have like a couple of notes that I'll be sending to Shana as well. Unfortunately, she couldn't make it today, but thank you so much for this. Honestly, like it was very insightful and I loved the, I love the different elements of just like fun scattered in between. So good. Honestly, it was a good time. And, um, your, there's a strike event happening today. Yeah, there's a boat cruise happening tonight that I'll be I will see you there, actually. Awesome. Cool. Cool. Right on. Right. I'll see you there. All right. Thanks so much again. Thank you. All right. I'm going to jump off. Thank you, everyone else, for being here. Uh, and again, don't be a stranger. I'll see you all soon. Take care.